while people still come in, I can at least start the intro. So welcome everyone. Thank you for logging on and attending this afternoon or evening's program, depending on where you are. My name is Matt Schumann. I'm on the programming team here at Cary Library. Conveniently, a helicopter flying overhead isn't doing this. Before we begin, just a few things to note. Uh, please let me know in the chat if there are any technical uh, issues that I can try to resolve. If you have any questions or comments for our speaker, please send them via the Q&A. This program will be recorded and posted on the library's YouTube channel, and I'll send out that link after uh, a few days after the program. Lastly, I want to thank the generous donors to the Cary Library Foundation and the Monroe Center for the Arts for partnering with us on this event. I'd like to now introduce our speaker, Susie Hodge. Susie holds a Master of Arts degree and is a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts. She has written over 100 books on art, art history, history and artistic techniques. Susie's other activities include lectures, talks and practical workshops, plus television and radio talks and documentaries about art. So now please welcome Susie. Hi, lovely to be here. Really lovely to be here after so long that, well, I did a few Zooms, but um, not. It, it went a bit strange for the last couple of years. But um, I want to start, I'm going to run through, it's going to be a real um, race through time from about the 1860s. And I just want to show you how art changed. I think most of us love to see beautiful art. We love to see um, art that we can see technical skill in. And then we get to the present day and you might go to a, a museum or a gallery or even a public space and think, what on earth is that? Well, I'm hoping to kind of take you through some of those. Obviously, I'm not going to answer all your questions today, just in a, this short time, but I'm hoping to take you through quite a few of them and show you so you can understand um, why it's gone from there to here. So you can see we're starting with this very traditional painting. You could see, um, OK, it wouldn't possibly be in the Renaissance, but it was painted in 1863 by an artist called Alexandre Cabanel, a um, French artist who was born in 1823, so he painted it when he was 40. He started painting when he was 10, and he was a, one of those child prodigies. Um, as soon as he started drawing and painting, his tutors apparently, allegedly said, you're so good, you've got to teach the others. So uh, he started quite well. Um, he lived in the south of France, a place called Montpellier, and everything happened in Paris. Hard to understand now, um, but there was such a strong um, official area of art in, in Europe um, at the time. It was mainly in Europe, mainly in Paris, and you, artists couldn't really get on without this academy or um the Academy owned, um, controlled the Ecole des Beaux-Arts, which was the main art school. If you wanted to get on as an artist, you had to go there because you were taught uh, technically and traditionally um, how to paint, how to draw, um, how to sculpt, if you're going to be a sculptor. Actually, they, they did take architectural students as well. The Academy also controlled the annual Paris Salon. There weren't many um, other exhibitions that you could show your work at. So it all happened in Paris and it was all controlled by the Academy. Um, there was also something that the Academy controlled. It was called the Prix de Rome. And that was a prize that one art, uh, actually, no, I'm lying. Um, two artists won each year. The Prix de Rome was, um, it was a really stringent um, exam. It was like loads of tests. You had to draw, it was all timed, draw a figure, paint a figure, um, do a, uh, no, they didn't do still life, paint a massive history painting. Uh, history painting was what they loved. History paintings were considered by the Academy as the greatest type of painting because they were usually huge, large in scale, lots of figures all in action doing things and lots of landscape scenery all around <clears throat> excuse me so um you do a history painting if you got through you were not you were eliminated you can imagine actually now there'd be a great reality tv show about this you know you'd start off with say a hundred art students and it would dwindle down week by week who got through to the next stage and then finally i think there were three 
uh, challenge to spend 10 weeks at their paintings. They kept them secret, they were huge, and then they'd unveil them. And judges on the academy would, would choose the winners. And the two winners would then get a, a prize. They would go to Rome for two or three years, all expenses paid, and be taught by the best tutors out there, meet all the greatest artists, because everyone since the Renaissance went to Rome. And um, so that was, sorry, this is a long-winded story of saying how Cabanel aimed for that and, and he did win it, but not with this painting. I just wanted to show you this because I wanted to show you what the traditional academic style of art that was approved of was the only type of art really in the 1860s that would get you through to become a great artist. Once you're in the salon, you were noticed, depending again where, where paintings were, were displayed, whether it was high up or low down and in a space of their own. But this was accepted in 1863 for the Paris Salon. And that's because he's, he's adhered to the technical traditional um, lessons that were taught by the Academy. So smooth painting, imperceptible brush marks, um, a, a very balanced composition, realism, realism conveyed by darks and lights, tonal contrast and a kind of traditional palette. You can see there's nothing untoward here. There's no bright colors that are jumping out at you. It's all very comfortable to look at. Her skin is very smooth. The baby, the cherub skin is also smooth. The sea is very blue. It's, it's a sort of very accepted and very, it was a greatly admired painting. I don't know if I can move it on. No, I'm sorry. I think Matt has to move it on. Sorry. <laughs> Matt, could you move? Thank you. Right. I just wanted to show you this one by Manet, painted in exactly the same year as Cabanel. Um, so Manet was a little bit younger than um, Cabanel, uh, nine years younger. And he also aspired to be accepted by the Academy. But he had other ideas. He was trained quite traditionally. He didn't actually go to the Beaux-Arts. Um, but he, this was strangely accepted for the Paris Salon, which when you look at it, I, I've never really found out why it was accepted because it goes against a lot of their traditions. I mentioned, you know, there's, there's not um, a balanced composition. It's a little bit lopsided. There's not um, the, the uh, range of tones. It's based on a painting by Titian, painted a long time before this in the Renaissance. Titian was um, a Venetian Renaissance artist, and it's based on his painting of Venus. The last one was Venus. Um, if you think of how she was, she was a nude, but she was in the premise of being a goddess. So really it was an excuse for men to paint beautiful women and men to look at beautiful women, but because she was a goddess, it was allowed. This, on the other hand, by Manet, was not a goddess. The painting was entitled Olympia, and Olympia in the 1860s was a common name for a prostitute. We know she's a prostitute, partly because, shockingly, she's actually staring boldly out of the canvas. I nearly said camera. It's similar, it's like a snapshot. It's a snapshot of a moment. Um, she's dressed, she's got a little choke around her neck, she's got a gold bangle on her wrist, she's got a, a, an orchid in her hair and little slippers on her feet. So she's actually, she might be a nude, but she's more naked than a nude, if you, if you get what I mean, the, the subtle difference there. She's adorned with, she's got earrings in her ears, she's adorned with quite expensive accoutrements. Not only that, her bed is a little dishevelled. She has a maid behind her bringing in flowers. I think you can get where we're going with this. And I don't know if you can see, in the uh, Titian painting of Venus, there's a little dog at the end of Venus's bed, a very smooth bed <laughs> for, uh, for Venus. If you can see on our right-hand side, there's a cat that's startled. So it's startled by someone who's walked into this, this boudoir, this room, and it would be you, the viewer, and most of the viewers would be men. So that's what made this painting really shocking. Um, the fact that one, it's not painted in the traditional way, and two, it's clearly a prostitute. What Manet was trying to do was to um, show people the real world. He wanted to adhere to kind of traditional compositions to a certain extent, but he wanted to show the real world. And the real world is not only ordinary people doing maybe not such ordinary jobs, but ordinary jobs, 
but also lighting in the studio it's not nature it's not natural so it's quite harsh lighting because she's she's lit by an oil lamp so this was painted at, yes in exactly the same year as the previous painting it was actually shown two years later at the paris salon but whereas the previous painting was accepted and admired and talked about and cabanel's uh, reputation went from strength to strength manet's was actually um actually diminished it was people talked about him what a shocking artist he'd already exhibited something even more shocking but the the main shocking elements as I say was she was obviously a prostitute she's looking at us very boldly which women should not be doing um I mean we'd be probably quite shocked by a few other things in this painting nowadays but that's what shocked the audience in those days um so you can see how he's changing things what happens when people are shocked and, and a lot of paintings shocked. I mean, um, Michelangelo's, a lot of Michelangelo's work shocked people in the Renaissance and then people came round to admiring it, maybe not as much as things like this, but it was the shock value that made it talked about that other artists then looked at and thought, I'm going to paint modern life. Why aren't we painting modern life? Why are we pretending that inside this frame of this canvas, it's a different world? Why don't we bring today's world to today's viewers. So he started to change things and he inspired, I mean, this is very um, bold and blunt to say he inspired realism and impressionism, but he had a big hand in it. He was really quite powerful in that. It wasn't just his paintings. He used to meet the artists and discuss his ideas with them. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm gonna have to glug of water. Can I have the next picture, please? Thank you, right. Jumping on. I'm going, as I say, I'm going to show you um, a range of art and a range of artists. So I'm sorry if they're not all, I try and put in my books a good range. There are plenty of women, plenty of people from all different backgrounds, but to me, they're artists. So um, if I haven't got enough of, of any particular um, group, I'm sorry, but I, I go by the art. I, I just love the art. And this was a lady called Harriet Hosmer and she was an American lady lived at the time 19th century this was this was made in 1866 and she lived at the time when ladies as i say should have been demure and retiring but her father who was a doctor a medical doctor physician um he was mourning the loss of his wife and three other children from tuberculosis and he was so deep in grief he said to her do anything you want. And she became very bold, very brave. He sent her off swimming. He sent her off to learn to paint and to sculpt. And she even went to Rome to study, which in those days, the place to go to, as I've mentioned, was Rome. And she became really successful. Not, I hasten to add, through um, the, the support of other men, because most other men were, were working. They were quite jealous and they tried to make trouble for her. But she, she persevered and she did extremely well. This is called um, the reclining fawn. And a fawn is um, half goat, half, half boy. And you can see, remember what I said about the academy saying, how everything has to be in a certain traditional way. It's kind of based on ancient Greece and Rome, and that's what they followed. And this sculpture is similar. It's idealistic. It's adhering to what the Academy would want, the academies of Rome and of Paris of, uh, of the time. The boy is absolutely perfectly proportioned. The skin is extremely smooth. The, the um, branch, the, sorry, the tree trunk, as you can see that he's leaning on, is rough and gnarled. Beneath him where he's sitting, there's soft, it looks like soft moss. She's managed to convey these different textures. He's dropped his lyre that he plays. He's got some grapes that look plump and juicy. And that's why she was admired. She was so technically clever. Um, but she was born in 1830, same sort of time as Manet. So she was adhering, whereas he was going again. Most people were adhering to um, the kind of art that was want, required of them because that was the only way they could make a living. And, and I think most people would. You had to be very bold, brave, brazen, not really care or, or completely convicted 
to paint in your particular way. I always think about that with Van Gogh. I mean, he knew what he was doing and we understand it now, but at the time, very, very few people understood it. And it's the same with a lot of these modern artists. Um, sorry, next, next work. So just a little bit of sculpture. Next work, please, Matt, thank you. Similar age, 10 years younger than Hosma. He was a great admirer of Hosma. This is Auguste Rodin, and he was also French. So we're jumping back to France. Um, he, he did the same training. He studied academically. He tried to, pay, uh, to create traditionally. Some of his drawings are so um, realistic. They're, they're incredible. And he, he really wanted to adhere to the academic style, but he couldn't help being more natural, more lively. Um, at first, his work was hated. As you can see, if you, again, compare it, if you can remember the, the previous image, it's less smooth. It's not quite as smooth. Oh, thank you. It's not quite as smooth. The person, the people have got more action. They're livelier. They're, um, they're, they seem to be moving. He's painted, he's created, I keep saying painting, sorry, it's paintings before. He's sculpted out of marble, both out of marble, um, a, a mytho mythological story. This is, these are two lovers and they met while they were reading about Guinevere and Lancelot. You can't see from this angle, but his left hand, which is at the back, is actually dropping the book they were reading. They read it together and then looked at each other across the book and fell in love. And this is their first kiss. But she is married to his brother. And at that moment, when they had their first kiss, so it's the ultimate of pure love, in walks his brother and kills them both. And they were left in the mythological story. Um, they were left to wander through hell for the rest of their lives. So it's quite a sad story. But um, Rodin creates the image when it's the happiest moment. And another thing that he did, I know I keep talking about this, but it is quite topical. He made the woman just as... Um, uh, demonstrative as the man so she's also she's not sitting there meekly and demurely this is pure love between two people equal love between two people um, there are several versions and I've noticed when I've seen them in different countries a couple have I'm not quite sure how they do it but her foot because he, he made a few different casts her foot um, her right foot is closer to his right foot but as you can see it's quite sweet the way he's he's managed to make it a very realistic um couple of positions there they've twisted and he obviously used real real models but he, he adhered to it so much so that one of his first sculpt uh, works of sculpture was criticized they thought he'd cast a real human which was illegal that he, he put plaster on a real human and then modeled around it but he he really didn't he was proved innocent that he he didn't do that so this was sorry i'm jumping around a bit i just need to tell you this was created almost 20 years after the previous work but um the previous type of works were still being made. So he changed sculpture and it became rougher, more, if you can see, you can compare literally where the boy, the fawn was sitting to where they're sitting. This is a rough rock, whereas he was on a very detailed, mossy lump of, uh, it might've been a rock, um, with, had moss on it and he had a tree trunk behind him. So next image, please. Right, I haven't mentioned one of the biggest things that changed um, art, one of the mass most massive changes, and it was invented in 1839, roughly, there's no exact detail, but roughly, and you probably are aware what I'm going to say now, photography, and that's really, yes, it probably had the greatest influence of anything on art. Um, you can see here what I mean, why I'm showing this. This is painted by Edgar Degas, who was born in 1834, two years after Manet. He knew Manet. He knew Rodin as well. They all knew each other. Um, Degas often grouped together with the Impressionists because he helped to organise their independent exhibitions away from the Paris Salon, which was really bold of them. And he exhibited in all of them. But um, he always said he never classed himself as an Impressionist. If you think the Impressionist painted impressions, very quick brush strokes, very quick marks. They looked at nature and they transferred what they saw as quickly as they could. This, this is me painting. 
<laughs> this is me looking at the sky and then painting it on my canvas in case you wondered. Um, this is, is not taken from, he, he did take lots of photos. This is painted in 1871 to 74. There's a similar version of this in New York. This one's actually in Paris in the Musée d'Orsay and it's called the ballet class. The dance class is in New York. And this was an actual dance class. Degas loved movement, even though he said, no artist was ever less spontaneous than me because it took him so long to paint them. They look like they're just about to move or they're just, they have just moved, but it took him a long time to paint this with, and all his paintings with lots of different sketches and photographs. The man in the middle is Jules Perrault, who was an actual famous dance teacher. Degas would go and he would be a member of the audience, he would go backstage and he was allowed to go into their dance classes to sketch. You might read strange things about Degas, but I think he was just, uh, um, I don't think there was anything wrong with him, he just didn't get married. <laughs> um, in those days it was unusual, but he, he had lots of female and male friends and he was just dedicated to his art. So what he would do was he would paint by day in the 1870s, he'd paint by day and at night he would go upstairs. He had another studio on his roof with lots of light and glass around the walls. And that was his photographic studio. And gradually by the 1880s and definitely by the 1890s, he took more and more photographs. So this was based on photographs and you can see what I mean when I show you Again, sorry, try and remember the very first painting, how all the figures were inside the canvas frame. There were no edges cut off as here. And if you think about when you take a photograph, sometimes we can't help it. You cut someone off at the edge or there's something <laughs> sticking out of their heads. Not really, it's behind them. And that's, as you can see, what's going on here. The, the viewpoint is from above. So he's obviously standing perhaps on a chair and looking down. Um, well, he, he would be, you know, it was in those days when they put a cloth over their heads to take the photograph. Um, the lighting, though, he's he's managed to diminish, to, to keep soft and subtle. It's not really um, bleached out by the, the flash. But this is all these young girls all caught in their natural poses, hand on hip, one's yawning, scratching her back, one's having a chat, one's stretching. Um, I think there's another one. Yeah, they're having a chat over at the back. I'm not sure if it's this one. Their mums have come in to take them home and all, all these sorts of things that you, if you were actually going to paint a picture before photography, you wouldn't do that. You'd have probably clumped them together in maybe a couple of little groups. But even the, the strong diagonals of the floor, which has the effect of drawing us into the image, was really something that was discovered after photography was invented. And once photography had been invented, artists had to go one way or the other because artists had earned, generally speaking, they'd earned their money through portraits. All the other stuff was... Um, they got money for it, but portraits was the bread and butter. It's the same as being an illustrator today. You can do lots of lovely, colourful illustrations, but your bread and butter work, I speak from experience, is black and white images. That's what's needed the most. And of course, practically overnight from photography being invented, people preferred to have their photographs taken. It was quicker, although you did have to sit still. And a lot of them had neck clamps to begin with. It was quicker. It was more accurate in realism. Um, and it was a great novelty. So artists had to think of different ways of working. Um, there was an artist called Paul Delaroche who said from, once photography had been invented, said from today painting is dead. Well, luckily it, it wasn't. I mean, if you think of um, a cartoon, I don't know, Tom and Jerry, how have, have the cartoon runs through a door and there's the cat the shape of Tom through the door. A real life, I know now you can with computers, but at the time, real life action couldn't do that. So cartoons did something different that film couldn't. Artists, painters, sculptors had to do something that uh, photographers couldn't, even though a lot of them, um, as I say, were artists by day and photographers by night, but why not? Um, sorry, I've talked too much about that one. I hope you like it. We'll have some questions or discussion at the end. Next painting, please. Oh, now you probably all recognise this one. Um, sorry. The Screen by Edvard Munch. Somebody's called it um, the Mona Lisa of our, of our day. As we all know it, it's such um, a common image. 
Edvard Munch painted this in 1893. So it was 11 years after um, Rodin's uh, sculpture of the kiss. It was 20 years after the last painting. I'm kind of chronological, but I'm not going in a straight line because it, it isn't linear. I'm, I'm sort of bringing you up to almost the present day. We don't quite get there, but um, almost the present day. And um, so I'm moving along slowly. Now he painted this after he had a vision. I have to tell you about Monk. He had a, a dreadfully sad life. His, his mother died when he was five and his elder sister Sophie who looked after him uh, died when he was 13 eight years later of the same tuberculosis. His father had lots of black depression uh, depressive moods. He brought him up um, he scared his son. I'm not quite sure why, but um, he had his reasons. He did love his son and um, he scared him as he was bringing him up with stories of death. And, and so Monk grew up morbidly afraid of death or fascinated by death, perhaps not afraid of it, but more fascinated by it. And this is also partly realism. Um, there was a, it was painted in Norway in Christiana, which is now Oslo. And it was after a volcanic eruption where for the whole of that year, 18, uh, 1883, he painted it of 1883. Um, there was a kind of red clouds hanging in the sky. I, I don't know if you've ever had it. We've had it here a few times. Um, in England, where the sky goes red, it actually goes red, and apparently it's um, sand from Spain. <laughs> um, maybe you, you have it from different parts of the world, it's to do with certain winds carrying sand. It doesn't happen often, but this, the whole of that year, apparently, the sky appeared red. And as I say, Edvard Munch had a vision that, um, it, I would like to ask you, but you can't answer me now, do you think those two men are walking towards him or walking away from him. And the reason I ask that is because I always think they look like they're walking away from him, but apparently, no, they're walking towards him. Sorry, I've really confused you now. I always think they look like they're walking towards him and they're quite ominous and he's screaming about them. But in his statement about this painting, he was with his two friends and they walked away from him. And then he heard this horrific scream of nature. That's the fjords, he's on a bridge over the fjords. It must've been quite, scary if he was prone to hallucinate extremely scary and he painted four versions of this and the reason I'm showing it to you is not because it's famous or to tell you about the volcanic eruption but because it changed a lot of the ways that certain artists thought it was one of the first paintings that painted from quite a selfish, very personal perspective. He was painting his feelings. It wasn't just what he saw or how he felt about nature. It was actually his emotions. So it was a little bit stronger than painting, as we say, going back to Van Gogh, painting blues because he felt blue or yellows because he wanted to feel happy. Um, he was actually conveying his emotions to viewers. And he, as I say, he painted four versions of this in different ways, different materials. This was painted with tempera and oil um, and crayon on card. You might think it's an oil painting on canvas, but it isn't. <laughs> um, and that changed everything. And this is partly because he befriended a philosopher at the time, an older man, and they used to talk a lot about feelings and conveying feelings and how the world should should be going from now. Because we, we were reaching the 20th century and, and I mean, that was going to be a great change. It was the 19th century was going off with the old and on with the new. And, and a lot of things were changing. Um, Art Nouveau was developed around then. And in fact, that's partly these swirling uh, lines. That's kind of the influence of, of Art Nouveau as much as anything. Um, and Art Nouveau was a new design movement created specifically for the turn of the century. So it was all, in some ways, although it might have, he might have been personally scared, it was all a little bit exciting. It was the new millennium that was, that was about to uh, come upon them. And he really, Edvard Munch really laid the way for the Expressionists. Um, and the Expressionists then continued by painting their emotions. And, we, and you'll see as we go along a lot more um, more artists painted their emotions. So I'm, I'm a bit slow. Can we can we go on to the next image? <laughs> I'll um I'll try and 
move quickly. Um, you'll probably be familiar with this, painted by Picasso. I have to tell you if you don't know, and if you're horrified by this, because some people are, um, when he was 14, he painted so realistically that he got into another one like Cabernet, um, that uh, he, he could, he painted so realistically that he entered um, a, a, an art school that much older students could go into and he did he did all his exams entrance exams in a week where they took a month so that's how we know that Picasso well, that's not how we know that's one of the reasons that Picasso was respected from the start but this he painted in 1907 after having been to a couple of exhibitions um, there uh, there's some influences of African masks and influence or influences of ancient Spanish masks as well. He wasn't the first to be influenced by African art. Um, again, sorry, I have to, uh, I should have said at the beginning, we are only talking about Western art today. Another time I might talk about uh, art of the rest of the world, but it's, it's, it's quite interesting the way it changes, it changes a lot more, um, which maybe isn't such a good thing, but um, yeah, so he was the first artist really to incorporate it. Uh, Gauguin looked at ancient art and, and ancient non-Western art and, and incorporated it, but not quite as much as uh, Picasso. He'd also just seen an exhibition by Cezanne and Cezanne was classed as an impressionist as Degas was. Um, Cezanne was born in 1839, Picasso was born in 1881. And he, um, greatly influenced by Cezanne. A lot of artists were influenced by Cezanne. Cezanne had gone away from the idea of painting literally what we see, the outside of what we see on our canvases and painting the internal structure. So painting from lots of different angles. If you think about the way we look at things, we don't keep stock still, unless we're having a photograph taken away clamped at the back of our necks as they did. Um, but we, we tend to move. So we see things almost our eyes jump about a bit. And that's how Cezanne painted, trying to pick up the whole structure of something, forgetting old fashioned, not old fashioned, uh, the traditional perspective, way of showing perspective on a flat surface. Cezanne believed he was being more honest because he was trying to show three dimensions on a two dimensional surface. And um, Picasso picked this up and this was classed as probably the most important painting of the 20th century. Painted in 1907. There are five prostitutes, it's called Les Demoiselles d'Avignon, and that was known as a, a place where prostitutes hung out. Um, and he's painted them, not necessarily to shock, just because it's an excuse to paint nudes. They're coming out from a curtain. He did change a couple of the, the two figures you see with the darker faces. They were originally, one was a doctor, uh, and that was his moral, Picasso's moral comment on um, why you shouldn't go with prostitutes and <laughs> the other one was um, the other one was a sailor and that was showing that it was a little bit immoral but then he decided it wasn't immoral at all they were just five stunning women and he wanted to show them in a different way he didn't want to do a cabanel and show traditional uh, idealistic perfect women and he did want to learn from Manet and paint with thin brush marks but marks that you could see on the canvas leaving gaps and spaces because that would have been considered by the academy absolutely horrific. Uh, the academy by this time when this was painted in 1907 had lost a lot of its power and that was partly to do with impressionism and post-impressionism um, and just partly to do with time as, as things change and they didn't move on and you, you'll find that happened in a lot of different countries at around the same time. Um, this was considered so shocking. Picasso, first of all, showed it just to a few people in his art studio. It was so shocking. He didn't show it for another nine years. And then he didn't show it again until he sold it to MoMA in New York in 1938. So 31 years after he painted it. It's huge, by the way. And that's another thing. So there's so many different things, I must tell you. It was huge. And that was considered quite shocking because the only huge paintings as I mentioned earlier, were the history paintings. Um, just to paint five prostitutes coming out from a curtain with a table of fruit um, that seems to be falling off the canvas was not uh, worthy of being on a large canvas. But this changed people's attitudes. The shock value changed people's attitude and attitudes and changed art. Sorry, next slide, please. Now, I want to ask you, what can you see here? Anything, nothing? Have a look at it, see what you think. 
You might have heard of Vasily Kandinsky. Um, he was born in Moscow. He grew up in Odessa, in Ukraine. Um, he went to school in Odessa, and then he went to university in Moscow. You might want to tell me afterwards, but he wasn't the first person to paint an abstract painting. I mean, apart from Aboriginal art and ancient art, I mean, modern day Western art. Um, this was painted in 1910 to 1911. I know he wasn't the first. And in my book, um, Artquake, that this is based on, um, they're not all, not all these images are in that book. And there are some more, a lot more images in the book that aren't here. But I wanted to show you this one for a reason, because it's kind of a, a bridge between abstract art and, uh, and uh, non-abstract art, uh, of, um, art that shows you the real world. And I, I'll tell you now, so you probably think it's abstract. Kandinsky was very involved in spirituality. He belonged to, um, uh, he, he believed in anthropos anthropocy and um, various other spiritualist uh, ideas at the time. If you think, so 1910, we were already, we discovered x-rays, we discovered uh, all sorts of um, powers that we can't see or even feel. And he believed in being able to connect with uh, the, the higher powers, the spiritual world through art. If you think, when you listen to music, we are transported, aren't we? we we don't necessarily, if you're listening to a piece of music, you're not necessarily focusing on the Eiffel Tower or um, a beautiful sea. You might do, but it's up to you. There's no specific thing. So unlike normal paintings, where it might be a painting of a sea or a nude or, or a still life, he thought that art should be the same and art should evoke emotion and bring you to um, a more spiritual level where you're in touch with your subconscious. So this was his one of his first moves away from realistic art, representational art. Um, it was, it's not completely abstract. It's an abstraction in that there are some things from the real world in here. Now, if you look at the top left-hand corner, can you see there's like a red triangle with a little almost blue, well, it's a red rectangle really, with a little blue triangle. That is, I'm just gonna try and do it now, I need to go that way. It's a Cossack, it's going like that. Um, these, this painting is called Cossack, so I've given it away really. He's holding a sabre. Oh, is that a lance? Sorry, I'm not very good on weapons. You need to ask my son about that. And the other one here, they're both on horseback, the black lines beneath them, the other one's facing him, the two curving shapes, sort of black with yellow inside with the red rectangles at the top. They are both Cossacks and they're fighting each other on horseback. Um, Below them, the kind of boomerang shapes, they're birds flying up in the air because they're of the noise that's going on. The red symbolizes blood, the red blob symbolizes blood. And down in the right, our right hand corner are three more of those red triangle shape, triangular shapes. You can see more birds over in the background. Um, and the red triangular shapes down in the right hand corner are more Cossacks, but whereas the others are cavalry, uh, uh, they're infantry, they're walking, and they've got lances or sabres or swords or something. Now behind them, the blue, for Kandinsky, blue is very spiritual, so he brings a lot of blue into his paintings. Um, there's some more vertical, well, they're kind of at a, an angle, but they would be vertical lines. They're, they're men marching, Cossacks marching over the hill. And behind that, I'm not sure if you can see it without me showing you but try and um, have a look it's got little lines on it it's a black outline sort of rectangular that's a fort and the rainbow can either be judged as spirituality a bridge or hope um, and all those things were brought into this painting and it's actually it's in this is in the Tate in London but it's actually part of a much larger painting um, called composition four and the whole point of Kandinsky becoming abstract was he stopped labeling his paintings by things that we could, can connect with the real world and called them either compositions, impressions, or things like that, the same as music. I could go on talking about Kandinsky, but I can see I need to move on, sorry. Can we go on to the next picture, please? Yeah, I, I just wanted I to, to- gallop through. I wanted to comment on this one before we move on, because you had, you had asked what we thought of, and. I, two things we didn't say are like I, I don't know why it makes me think of like music 
like good it's meant to these lines kind of remind me of like a staff on the left um, yeah or or this the whole like i don't know if you can see my cursor the rhythm or, yeah I don't, um this almost looks like a giant person to me like a clown and like that's the mouth there i don't know there are two people at the top on the horses yeah. can you see this but yeah it's great that you can see things in it because this was what abstract art became it's it's the viewer is just as important as i'll show you as um the artist and that's how kandinsky was one of the first to change it and he was really connected to um uh, music. I, I could go on. I don't know if any of you have heard of a, 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 a condition called synesthesia, and it's it's different in different people. Some people have it. I have it, and uh, my brother had it. My daughter has it. My son doesn't. And it's when you hear music, you see color. When I speak, it sounds really creepy. People look at me like I'm insane, but it's what I was born with. When I speak, every letter, every word is in color. So, and days of the week are in color. And he had it di completely differently to me. I'm not saying I'm anything like Kandinsky. I'm just saying it is a, it's a muddling of the senses. And he had it, which is why music and color for him was, was connected and really inter interconnected. Sorry, can we see the next image, please? I'm not sure where we're up. Ah, oh, I just wanted to show you this briefly because what changed in the world were loads of revolutions from the turn of the century of the 20th century there were different obviously the industrial revolution was the end of the 18th century then you had um also at the end of the 18th century the french revolution but the beginning of the 20th century you had the mexican revolution and in Mexico, you've probably heard of Diego Rivera. He painted these massive murals. I don't know if you, you can see it. It might be confusing, but the picture behind shows you the mural on the staircase of the Mexican National Palace. The picture in front shows you the bit that's coming towards us down the stairwell. Um, and that's how huge it was. And Mexico had had a lot of uh, dictators. It had been oppressed by lots of different countries, Spain, France. And um, by 1930, although he painted this in 1944, uh, sorry, no, he painted this in the, in the 1930s, 35. Um, the next painting's 44. Um, by 1935, they felt that they were out of it. They felt that they were safe. And he's painted, uh, uh, not sure if you can see that there's so much I'm I won't go into it because we'll be here all night and all day uh, there's the Ku Klux Klan there's all kinds of quite horrific things going on and it's all about how the Mexican people were oppressed but he felt that they were they were free and I wanted to show you a painting by Diego Rivera I'm he was born in 1883 so um compared to say Rodin we've moved on 43 years um and he, he was born sort of soon after uh, the Impressionists became popular. And he's gone right back to painting realistically, which was unusual in Europe, but not unusual elsewhere. Um, but you'll see it was quite naive, his style. So next picture, please. And I think you'll be familiar with this one. Or you'll be familiar with the person who painted it. So he married Frida Kahlo. And you probably know about this. Uh, she was over 25 years younger than him. She was tiny, he was huge. He'd had three wives. She was, uh, he'd had two wives. She was his third wife. Um, she had a horrific uh, bus crash, been in a horrific bus crash when she was 18 in 1925. This was painted in 1944. I linked them together because um, obviously they painted at the same time, but she was not at all famous while he was alive, while they were alive together. Her fame didn't come till a long time after she died. She, she was born in 1907, the year that Picasso painted Les Demoiselles d'Avignon, and she died in 1954, and she suffered um, physically all through her life. And normally, um, if you go to a gallery or a museum, you might think, well, the artist's life isn't relevant. And sometimes it isn't that relevant. Very often it is when they were born, where they were born, what happened to them as children, as adults. But hers is so significant because she said she painted herself because she was her own reality and she was all she knew. And for 
years, two years, she was on her back after she had this terrible accident. Um, she'd had a crushed pelvis. She had to have, much later, she had to have part of a leg amputated. And this was a time where she'd just been told she had to wear a steel corset, to, literally to support her, to lift her up, to hold her organs. She had several miscarriages. Um, she had three abortions because she couldn't, she would have died and the baby would have died it. So, you know, it was, it was elected. It was, um, it, it was just part of her life. So many horrible things happened to her. And she always expressed her own feelings. So we're going back to Munk, allowing that sort of give enabling artists to do that. The barren landscape at the back is how she felt so desolate without the child she wanted. She had a very volatile relationship with, um, Diego Rivera. He could not be faithful, so she started to have affairs with men and women. But and they divorced in 1939, and then they married again in 1940 because he'd had an affair with her younger sister, who was living with them at the time. Anyway, we won't, <laughs> it's just, I'll have you sobbing. But this was you can see partly um, she was devout Catholic, and it's partly her um, upbringing. Her mother was the devout Catholic, but she was, you know, it was rigorously inflicted in her, and. So the corset is on her, she's split in the middle, it's called the broken column. And the column you can see is like a Greek column in the middle, it's supposed to be her spine and it's crumbling and breaking. And the only thing that's holding it up is her steel corset. She had originally painted herself completely nude, but she swathed herself here in um, a white cloth because it's, uh, it's a reference to Christ's shroud. And she's not likening herself to Christ, but she's likening herself to someone who'd suffered. However, oh, and the, and the, the nails in her body are all the, where she was nailed together, various places. Um, but it's also a reference to St. Sebastian, who was uh, strung up and fired with arrows, killed with arrows. But you can't see it here. And she explains, you might be able to see it, it depends how close you can get. She said um, she's painted in her eyes the doves of peace to show that she's not in pain. She has her own mind to keep her calm and that the peace is in her head. So again, we're going back to the whole idea of um, conveying your emotions. Um, but it's it also expressing in 1944, just sort of towards the end of the World War elsewhere. This is painted in Mexico. So she was slightly unscathed by the war, but very uh, touched by her own uh, illness and pain and suffering. Next image, please. We're nearly there, I think. I can't remember where we're up to. Very good. Oh, gosh. Am I, am I, have I gone beyond? Am I too late? Should I speed up or is this okay? No, no, no. You're, you're, you're okay. Fine. Oh, good. Yeah. Oh, good. Um, abstract expressionism that emerged after the world, uh, Second World War. It was by artists, you might not have heard of this lady, Helen Frankenthaler. Now, we know all about Jackson Pollock and, um, Willem de Kooning, lots of male, uh, Mark Rothko, lots of male artists. And you'll be right in thinking it was dominated by men, but it was almost equally dominated by women. It was a very equal art movement. Not only was it equal, it was the first major art movement to start in America. Hooray! <laughs> We've got the, it moves around. If you see, there was, there was Italy, well, there was Greece and Rome, then there was Italy, then there was France. And now this America. So it does move around the center of art. Nowadays, I think, unless we go way into the future, you can't really call it, you can't really say where's the center of art. We're so universal, computers, internet, we can't really say. But in the 1940s, just after World War II, America definitely dominated and started this movement that was labeled derogatively, and a lot of the labels are derogative, abstract expressionism. And Helen Frankenthaler painted this after she'd visited um, Nova Scotia. Now, most abstract expressionist works are completely abstract. Unlike uh, the Kandinsky, you shouldn't be able to see anything in it because it's come from the artist's subconscious. Not only does it come from the artist's subconscious, they a lot of them practiced something called automatism, where you just let your mind go. You, you, almost go into a trance you stop thinking about what it is you're doing this came from uh, the uh, surrealists in the 1920s and you just paint so Jackson Pollock for example just painted on his floor 
only person to do that massive canvas on his floor, threw paint, tossed it on, walked on it, flipped it. Helen Frankenthaler invented an art uh, style where she, it was called the soak stain process, where she soaked her paints into, she diluted them into, in terps, and she soaked it into the canvas. This does actually represent her feelings about Nova Scotia. So in a way you can see a bit of blue sea and some greenery, which was grass, and you can see some maybe some vegetation, maybe some yellow is the sun, but it's not meant to be actually representational. And it's it's the first time really that artists said, we've got our art is is dictated to, is just defined by, by our viewers. So whatever whatever any of us see, whether you haven't ever read anything about art history or you've studied it for years, whatever you see, whatever you bring from your experiences, in this work of art you're allowed to that that's what the work of art means and you're allowed to say it and feel free to to carry on saying it so these were huge again going against the traditionalists that a huge work of art should only represent a history subject or glorify the country it came from it, this was just glorifying paint and canvas and feelings next painting please or it might not be a painting i can't remember Oh, yep, that one. <laughs> um, right, so the last painting was um, in the 1940s. This was painted, actually it was 1952, sorry, but abstract expressionism was invented in the 1940s. This was, we're jumping back to London. Now, pop art was invented in London and New York, almost sim simultaneously, for slightly different reasons. Some overlapped and some were slightly different. But in the end, it was all the same and it continued and it still really continues. It's one of the most popular art movements that have ever been. And there's a reason for that. Um, this is by an artist called Richard Hamilton. And it was in 1956 that it was created. It's very small. It's a little collage as a poster and to go in a catalogue for an art exhibition called This Is Tomorrow. And it was all about what was happening. So 1956, England, Britain was not really very rich. Gone through World War II, loads of places bombed, lots of people lost their lives, lots of people suffering after effects of the war, not much money about. But the British could see that consumerism was coming. They looked to America and they saw that they could get comics, they could get movies, they could um, uh, was the pill yeah the pill came quite soon afterwards they could go out they could get almost takeaways they could get tins of food as you can see uh, over near the woman's knee there's a tin of ham on the table and this is all cut out from a collage uh, from magazines so we've got very briefly true romance is it true now I'm naming the film young romance sorry um on the back wall the man is he just won Mr LA he was in a magazine the lollipop with the word pop on it. it was the first time pop had appeared in a work of art um there's a tape recorder the latest thing the woman is looking a bit ridiculous on the sofa but he said he had to bring people into it he really just wanted to show uh viewers what the world was about relate to the real world there's a little lady going up the stairs and it says um ordinary vacuums reach only this far this is advertising hoover and the painting is called just what is it that makes today's homes so different, so appealing? Oh, there's a film advertised at the back, a, a movie from a, one of the old talkie movies when uh, uh, talking first came in. And it's all about the modern day and how we should celebrate and uh, in some ways celebrate and in some ways watch out for consumerism and mass production and make sure we don't get swallowed up by it. Weirdly, the, the ceiling is the, is the planet Earth. <laughs> So this is 1956 in London. Can we see the next image, please? We're going to jump six years, 1962 in New York. Actually he exhibited this in LA, first of all. Andy Warhol. Andy Warhol um, and others, American pop artists, so they're all labelled pop artists in London and New York. American pop artists, a completely same idea, consumerism, um, kind of celebrating and kind of criticizing the mass production and the accessibility of all these things you know anyone could go out and buy a can of Campbell's soup whether you're a millionaire or whether you had your last um 
little bit of money to go and spend. Anyone could buy it, a child could buy it, an adult could buy it. And this was what they were kind of celebrating and criticizing. They were commenting and throwing it out there. But they were also, the American artists were also completely against abstract expressionism that had just gone before. They thought it was self-indulgent. They thought it was a bit soppy. It was only for the elite. If, if people went to an art gallery, they would stand back, oh yes, I, I see Boosey and I, you know, that sort of thing. Um, so pop art was for the people, of the people. Andy Warhol actually paid for this idea, not completely, not the way he handled it, but the idea of painting soup cans. There was a, a lady called um, Muriel Lato, who was, oh, Latow, who was, she owned a gallery and she was an interior designer. And he said, I need an idea. I've got Lichtenstein who's, who's painting comics and I've got um, other artists who are doing all sorts of amazing things and getting noticed. I want to do something that appeals to everyone. Um, but makes my name. He was a really successful illustrator and um, for advertising. He worked in advertising, worked in marketing, and really highly successful. He didn't have to be an artist. So I'm not decrying his ideas. And it was his idea how to do it. And she said, why don't you just do something that everyone recognizes like dollar bills or Campbell soup? So this is 32 canvases, 32 varieties of Campbell soup that he said he had every day for 20 years for his lunch. And um, so everyone is a different variety. He he got away. He, he did away with artistic skill. Um, he used mechanical reproduction. He did away with artistic skill by taking a photograph of the can of soup. Then he projected it on his canvas and he traced. And that's because photography could do all that. No longer was artistic skill important. He also exhibited each one on a shelf so it looked like a supermarket. So he was conveying that art should be for all of us. We should all be able to appreciate it and enjoy it, not go to a gallery and, or a museum and look at something and wonder what we're doing here and feel uncomfortable. And that's why it's endured really. And he was the first person to say, art is art if an artist says it is. So think about that one. So you could do anything you like. And if you say it and you're an artist and you say it's art, it is art. Next slide, please. I'm not sure if you can see this very clearly. Minimalism similarly started in America and it was again a real reaction against abstract expressionism. And then when it was invented, it was about the 1930s, but it didn't really come to the fore until the 60s. Um, about the same time, a little bit later than uh, pop art, um, it was just three main men, Donald Judd, uh, Carl Andre, and I'll think of his name in a minute. But nowadays, because it's continued, it's, it's quite a successful movement that's continued. And nowadays, there are a lot of women minimalists as well, you'll be pleased to know. Um, and Carl Andre, this got named, this actual piece of work is one of eight. And he got 125 bricks. And why did he get 125 bricks? Minimalists used things that were already made, already out there. You know, it could be a glass, it could be a book, it could be um, a, a plank of wood. Things that had already been made for other purposes and they repurposed them and put them in galleries, similarly to pop artists, so that we can all relate to them. But also, um, when you go around an art gallery or a, a museum and you walk around a work of art rather than seeing it on a wall, it's more, it becomes more your own. Your space changes, the space that you're in changes. I know this might sound a bit, bit pompous, but that's what they were trying to do. And they're all different kinds of things. Donald Judd, for example, put um, uh, bits of metal on kind of ladder formations on walls and uh, Carl Andre used blocks of wood or bricks. So he used 120 bricks each time for eight works of art and he called them equivalent because each time, even though he did them in different formations, they were the same number of bricks. They were equivalent of each other. So I keep going over here because I keep getting emails popping up. Um, so I don't know if you can see this. So this was bought by the Tate Gallery in 1966. Nobody really noticed it. Tate Gallery is a, um, a is paid for by um, taxpayers, as, as a lot of galleries are. And no one really noticed it. And then three and a half years later, 
um, there was, it had been exhibited twice in two exhibitions, so it was focused on, but still nobody noticed it. Then, yeah, three and a half years later, um, the, the Sunday Times, a newspaper in London, in, in England, uh, ran the headline, what's this pile of bricks? What are we paying for? You know, it was criticised then. And suddenly there was an uproar all the tabloids, all the local papers were saying, what is this pile of bricks we paid for? Whereas nobody had really noticed it. And everyone got so cross, my own dad included, because I was a child at the time. And I remember, um, oh no, this is the 70s, so I was a child, sorry. <laughs> um, he uh, he just he moaned about it over breakfast once. And he was saying how um, we're wasting our money and we shouldn't be paying for this. And really it's, it's terribly sad because it's just known now as the bricks, and nobody really bothered to see what uh, what Andre was trying to do. Uh, but he was actually trying to make us look at art and reconsider all of art, and, and that sounds really pompous, but he was trying to make us think, why do we look at things? What does art do for us? And are there different ways of looking at things? And from this came various other art movements and ideas. Sorry, next image. We must be nearly in now. I can't remember how many I'm up to. Yes, very nearly in. Two more. This is wow. this is this one and the last one. Very quickly, the reason I've shown you the little one in the corner is because the artist Chris Ophelia, um wanted to liken this his painting to a medieval icon. So you can see there's the gold shimmering background. There's Mary in blue, um, whereas the medieval one that was uh, is a mosaic actually was made in the ten to ten to 12th centuries in Constantinople, Istanbul now. Um, this one was made in 1996, where she's got the baby. Um, Chris Ophelia's uh, Virgin Mary has a lump of elephant dung on her, where her breast would be. I have to just tell you a very quick background. In 1997, sorry, I get my years right. I have to remember all these things. Um, there was an exhibition started in London. Charles Sartre was a great patron of the art, still is. Um, and he, there was an exhibition of his, all his collection, 42 artists, I think it was 110 works in London's Royal Academy. And it was called Sensation, a collection of the works of art by Charles, uh, owned by Charles Sartre, the Charles Sartre collection. And Chris Ophelia, this painting was one of them. It wasn't the one that caused the most um, Ferrari in uh, London. The, the one that really shocked everyone was um, a paint, it was hand prints, little children's hand prints making up the face, the known face, everyone recognised this woman's face, of Myra Hindley, who was a child murderer who was alive and in prison at the time. And that's what shocked a lot of people. Um, there was picketing outside the gallery. It was, it really, um, it caused so much uproar that millions went to see it as you would you just heard about this shocking um exhibition i know someone who was a royal academy Acad i can never say it, academician um and he left on the strength of this art exhibition he hated it well it then went to berlin and then it went to america um it went to boston i think and in boston yes it was um it was considered th this painting was the one that caused the most uproar because it was considered blasphemous and after it'd been exhibited for uh, the exhibition had been going on for some time an elderly gentleman threw white paint over this because he was horrified by it but what Chris Ophelia was saying was every time he went into the National Gallery in London he saw images of the Virgin Mary and he thought they were quite provocative and he also as a child he grew up thinking well white is pure what's black if white is pure, what's, you know, so it came from his emotions. So we're still talking about painting emotions. I don't know if you can see all these little things everywhere. They're bottoms. Um, <laughs> they're bottoms that have been cut out and they're stuck on with collage. And he used elephant dung, the painting at the very bottom underneath the canvas, uh, two elephant dung um, blobs holding it up. And he wanted the painting to step away from the wall. He wanted it to be a bit like the bricks, a bit like quite a few of the things that we've discussed, to be 
in viewers space to be part of people's lives he wanted people to be able to relate to her he said she was just a virgin mary but he painted his own hip-hop version and she's she's actually right when you look at her she's actually really pretty with all her sort of flowing curves it's very natural if you move away from the fact that why are we showing parts of the anatomy that aren't, isn't usually shown and you move away from that. The dung was from a trip to Zimbabwe he went to and he wanted to bring a bit of Africa back to England because that's what he is. He, he's, um, he descends from, he has African heritage. And so that's why he uses elephant dung. And really it, it's not offensive. If you look at it in that way, we no longer, a lot of artists no longer use paint at all. He's actually used paint, he's used spray paint, he's used pins, um, glitter and, it's all, each work of art that I've shown you has moved art on a little bit further. Some of the ideas have been taken by some artists and some by others, um, and some have been put together. So each one is different. This is a, a, a flat painting. Again, it's, it's going back to some of the images we looked at earlier. They don't have to be 3D anymore. It doesn't have to look 3D. A photograph can do that. So why does this have to? But I wanted to give you the very last painting. Can we see the last image? I'm going to bring you almost back, but not. <laughs> it is a painting, an oil painting on canvas. It's a huge oil painting on canvas, so it's not a history painting. It's a nude. And the reason I've shown you the little tiny Venus by Cabanel that we looked at right back in the beginning is to show you the similarities and the differences, almost where we've come. This is painted by an artist called Jenny Savile. She's Scottish. Um, she lives in the British Isles. It was sold in 19, oh no, 2018, sorry, for nine million pounds, 12 and a half million dollars, roughly. Um, and it's a nude. It's a nude painted by a woman. It's a self-portrait, but please, as with Frida Kahlo, is exaggerated. She's done it on purpose to do the opposite almost of what Cabanel's done. Cabanel's tried to make the most beautiful woman and as we might consider in society, not necessarily the most beautiful, but what society might think is the most beautiful woman. And she's done the opposite. What society might think is the most not beautiful woman. And she's, she's facing these taboos. She grew up, she said in the eighties when um, fatness is, con is so judged, obesity is so badly judged, um, People are, are considered greedy as soon as they're looked at. The skin is mottled, it's not smooth. She's used um, quite traditional paint marks. She's, she's made it look 3D and realistic, but rather than this first nude, Cabanel's nude, look at her, she's, she's leaning back, she's relaxed, she's happy in her own skin. This woman is looking in a mirror, and we know that because we have some scratched um, words back to front, so we know it's a mirror she's looking at, and she's looking really uncomfortable. Her feet are kind of twisted in, her fingers are, are gripping into her thigh. She's sort of almost trying to cover herself up. It's self-loathing, and it's, it's almost, she wanted to show, Jenny Savile wanted to show men that women aren't always just there with smooth skin and, you know, the, the old story. And she wanted to make uh, the art world more equal. And it's going that way, but it's not completely. But she is quite rare that she uses paint. So I must say, if we go on again, if we have another talk like this, I'll show you some where there's no paint used at all. Paint hasn't been used by many artists. It's quite rare. She had to push and fight to get her works through. And now she's one of the most expensive art living artists, um, so certainly one of the most expensive female living artists. Um, and she's done lots of work. The, the words actually, they're very, they're illegible. They're very hard to read, but they come from um, a female philosopher's uh, essay. And it's all about how we view ourselves and each other and that everybody is I'm sorry way beyond when I should have stopped but that's the end of it of the the talk today no it was fantastic I I think you spoke for a perfect amount of time and of course I want to know more about each of these paintings I mean it's only a cursory I'd love to talk to you more but I, I did realize I spoke a bit too much oh no no, no. Um, if anyone has any questions please submit them uh, via the Q&A um, there was someone who said thank you so much this is wonderful um, 
I had a question back from the beginning. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Louise Mary. <laughs> I had a question from uh, back at the beginning. We were talking about like um, the Paris Salon and Manet. Yes. And um, uh, I, I was curious, like, I know that you said it was it was a controversial piece uh, for, for its subject matter, but why, if that's how like how the society felt and whatnot, why did they allow Accept it, it in the first place? Do you know, this is my eternal question. Um, <laughs> Manet, exactly the same. I've never really found out why, because the moment it was exhibited, it was scorned, it was sneered at, it was criticized, but Manet had a classical education and mm. his earliest paintings were classical. So all I can think was that they looked at it and thought, maybe it's not what we think it is <laughs> maybe there is some merit in it that's all i can think i agree with you and it was two years after he submitted it so he had to submit it twice before it was accepted but i i'm completely in the dark as well i would like to know why they accepted it because after that he wasn't accepted his stuff was not and and he always wanted to he always strived to be part of the paris salon even though he dared to be different sure um, I also was curious uh, with the scream jumping forward a, a bit. Yeah. Um, why didn't painters up until that point necessarily paint their like feelings or the self? Their emotions, their feelings. Because surely in, oh, in can... literature and whatnot, I imagine. Yes, they did. You're right. Art was so rigid, and. Um, that's why uh, abstract art didn't come till much later because you think music, as I mentioned, music's always been abstract, um, but art was so rigid and so controlled by these academies that it was considered self-indulgent. You, you had to adhere, you, artists spent years studying and uh, they had to learn to draw first, draw from plaster casts. Women didn't go to the norm, the proper academies, the proper schools. They weren't allowed to paint nudes or draw nudes. And it was so rigid that it was just considered too self-indulgent. And then partly because he was in Norway, so he was a step away from Rome, Paris, London, not so much New York then, but, but a bit later, partly because of that snobbery didn't really exist. So, and he didn't really care. He called his art his children. So really it was therapy for him. He didn't really care if it was exhibited or not. Interesting, wow. Um, I, I don't see any uh, questions in, but I was just gonna, uh, before I let you go, the, the two funny things that I felt like you had said were the, the Rodin, that they that they thought that might be a person cast in yeah. plaster is absurd to think of. It is absurd now. And and I really uh, personally, I've I've kind of never I don't have an art background, and I've never understood Andy Warhol. But I love the sentiment that it's um, like creating art for everyone, and like and that it really just, changed a lot. That's fascinating, and and uh, I I hope that that would have had you know, a huge impact on people and their relationship with art and going to museums and stuff. But um, I, I hope just... so because it's awful to think it's still got that snobbery around it. It it, it really art, artists aren't snobby. Most of them, I don't know any snobby. You know, they they make it for people to look at, everyone to look at and enjoy. Yeah. Or they want to say something about the world. Yeah. So Absolutely. it should be. Yeah. Well, I just want to say thank you again for uh, giving us this presentation. This was absolutely fascinating. Um, thank you. If, if you're interested in uh, Susie's book, Art Quake, it is available through the library or through your um, any bookstore. Oh, yeah, she has it right there. No, um, no, they'd get it from the library. I still get I get something called oh maybe I don't in America so I get something in England called PLR which is public lending right so you get a few little bit of money every time someone borrows it oh that's, that's interesting that's I don't interesting. think it's only in England well thank you again uh, highly thank recommend you. the book there's so many more examples and uh, I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to to teach us about all these different disruptive artists they're really great Thank you, it's been lovely.
really lovely. Love, love to everyone across the Atlantic. Have a good night. Have a good day, everyone. Thanks, and you. Bye.